Welcome to episode five of Bitchy History, the American history podcast that really just wants to sit down and have a conversation with the person who wrote Pocahontas 2, Journey to a New World. A nice, peaceful conversation that will involve no cast iron frying pans or concussions whatsoever. We promise. Uh, oops. Welcome back to yet another episode of Bitchy History. I got a 23andMe kit for Christmas last year. You know the ones. You fill up a vial with spit, send it into some shady company, and hope that you don't find out some dark family secret as a result. Luckily, there was no dark family shame lurking in our past. My dad is my dad. That was never in question. I got his nose. But we did find out someone had been fibbing about the family lore. See, on my dad's side of the family, the story has always been that we're part Native American. Choctaw, as the story goes. Obviously, this is a podcast, so you can't see me, but if you could, you would probably be giving me criminally offensive side eye, because I get sunburn if I even think about going to the beach, but look, that's just the family story. But when I got my results back, there wasn't a single drop of native blood to be found. My family's bloodline is mayo on everything, raisins in the potato salad white. Like, British, Irish, French, German, broadly Northwestern European, and like 1.7% Italian. That's where my love of carbs comes from, I'm sure. This makes total sense. The native bloodline thing never really made sense, and honestly, it's kind of a relief. Because when you look at, like my family, and you're from the South, and your cursory genealogical research finds more than one ancestor on the wrong side of the Civil War, well, there probably wouldn't be some sort of grand, romantic, consensual reason for there being anything non-European in my genetics. I bring this up in the interest of full disclosure, because I'm about to dive headfirst into an episode that's dealing with a very sensitive historical topic. Pocahontas. And the optics on that are cringe, to say the least, because I am super white. All I can say is that I am dedicated to doing the best job on this subject that I possibly can, and at the very least, it will be a better history than the Disney movie. Of course, this episode isn't just about Pocahontas. I had planned to do an episode solely about her, but I quickly realized just how wrapped up her history is with that of Jamestown and John Smith's years there, and it would be more confusing than helpful to try to untangle that knot. I want to start this episode out by discussing something that I've been meaning to discuss for a few episodes now, and that's the weirdly sexual lens that European explorers viewed the New World through. The New World was a land described as fertile and ripe to be conquered, And as nauseating as those descriptors already are, they've got nothing on this quote from Sir Walter Raleigh, who described the Guiana region of Venezuela as a country that hath yet her maidenhead, essentially comparing it to a virginal woman waiting for the right man to fuck it. European explorers wrote about how the womb of the native lands were barren, judging the natives as poor stewards of their land because they failed to cultivate them in the same way that Europe had done with their own farmland. These sexualized metaphors were only exacerbated by the way that explorers hypersexualized native women. Amerigo Vespucci wrote about female cannibals that attacked sailors and claimed native women were so insatiable that, as I've mentioned in a previous episode, they forced their husbands to enlarge their penises by having venomous animals bite them. Columbus and Cortez both wrote about violent Amazon-like women who were living without men, which, I don't know about you, dear listener, but that's a vibe for me right now, actually. Explorers judged the natives, especially harshly for their clothing, or lack thereof, that they wore, and the liberalism of their sexual expression. Exploring the New World was a conquest, but not just economic and political, it was also sexual. Which goes a long way toward explaining how we ended up with the eventual narrative of Pocahontas falling in love with John Smith, but I'm getting ahead of myself on that. Let's go back to the beginning of this story. The year is 1596, or thereabouts, and the daughter of Wahseneca, also known as Powhatan, has just been born in the Chesapeake Bay area, which the natives call Sinacomico. This is where her father is the chief of 28 or so tribes. He rules over a population of about 25,000. The infant is named Maraoka, but during her childhood she would be given the nickname of Pocahontas, which means something like mischievous one or joyous one, which tells us a lot about her personality as a child. We don't have many hard details about her early life. No written records were ever kept. So we speculate based on the understanding we have of the culture of the Chesapeake area tribes at that time. In the culture of her people, traditionally, Madaoka would have been born in her father's village, but returned with her mother to her mother's village until she was weaned. Then she would have been returned to her father to reach adulthood, while her mother was able to choose a new partner. 
However, we don't know much about her mother or if Madaoka was raised by her. It's possible that the mother died in childbirth and she was raised by her father, which might explain why she was described as his favorite child. Culturally, we know a bit about what childhood would have looked like for Pocahontas. She was a member of the Pamunkey tribe, and as a young girl, she would have worn little to no clothing, had her hair shaven except for a very small section in the back that was grown out long and usually braided. As she grew to adulthood, she would have been taught women's work. Even as the daughter of the chief, she would need to know how to perform the tasks required by her tribe. For her tribe, women's work would have been separate from men's, but both were equally important to the survival of the tribe. Women bore children and raised them. They were responsible for building the houses they lived in. They did most of the farming, cooking, water collecting, foraging, firewood gathering. They made baskets, pots, and utensils. They also prepared and preserved the meat and hides brought back from the men who hunted. And, well, I guess defended the tribe. I don't know. Look, I researched what the women did in this tribe for my women's history class. They definitely did something, but this is about Pocahontas, so let's get back to that. So now it's 1607 and boats full of white men show up. Pocahontas is 11 years old, not even an adult woman by her own tribe standards. You can see where the whole love story element of this starts to fall apart, right? Because if this is a love story, John Smith, who was 27 at the time, would need to be on a list somewhere, and not just by modern standards. The average age of marriage in England around this time was about 26 years old for men and 23 for women. No matter what some men's rights activists with their own podcasts want to tell you, grown men marrying barely pubescent girls was not actually normal back in the old days, and anyone who keeps insisting that it was should probably have their hard drive checked. But that's a topic for another podcast. And it's not just the torrid romance part of the usual narrative of Pocahontas and John Smith that isn't accurate. In fact, most of the story you think you know is a pure fabrication, whether you got that fabrication from Disney or because you once saw the painting in the Capitol building of Pocahontas saving his life. So what really happened with Pocahontas, John Smith, and Jamestown? Well, the answer to that is... Not much, honestly, by which I mean that we don't have much written record of that period that mentions Pocahontas at all. But let me take you through what we do know. In May of 1607, a group of 144 Englishmen arrived to build the first permanent English settlement in North America on the banks of the James River. They built a fort, thatched huts, a storehouse, and a church. They tried to farm, but most of them were townspeople or gentlemen adventurers who scorned manual labor, and they had unfortunately arrived during a major drought, which didn't make things any easier. They didn't know how to take advantage of the wilderness, and supplies from England arrived late when they arrived at all. Jamestown was funded by a joint stock company, and the colonists were told that if they did not generate any wealth, financial support for their efforts would end. Many of the men spent their days vainly searching for gold and very little time farming. Food supplies dwindled, and John Smith, one of the governing body of the colony, realizes that the colony will not last without trading partners. Between April and December of 1607, Smith begins to explore the surrounding area and makes trade agreements with the local native tribes. Still, malaria and poor living conditions are going to kill at least 60 of the original settlers by September of 1607. In December, Smith sets out on the Chickahominy River and is captured by Chief Powhatan's men. One day, I may do a more in-depth episode on this entire incident, but for now, what you need to know is that late in 1608, Smith would write a letter back to the Virginia Company detailing this incident, among a long description of other events of the first year of the colony. And at no point in this letter would he ever mention hearing of or having any interaction with Pocahontas, certainly no mention of her saving his life. In fact, the infamous scene of Smith nearly having his head bashed in by the chief is also never mentioned. Instead, Smith details a rather civilized meeting with the emperor of the local tribes, after which Smith is escorted back to Jamestown with a friendly trade agreement. Powhatan is mentioned as sending provisions regularly to Jamestown. The relationship with the natives seems to improve. Smith even mentions visiting Powhatan's village again and bringing him gifts. It's not until much later in this letter that Pocahontas is even mentioned. In the summer of 1608, Powhatan apparently sends her, along with other people from the tribe, to ask for some native prisoners to be released. Smith describes the girl as witty and spirited, a young girl of about 10 years old. The men are released to Pocahontas, and they give her gifts as well and send her off back to her father. This is the only time she's mentioned in this letter. Not really the exciting stuff that Disney films are made of. 
Pocahontas does spend some more time at Jamestown over the next year, her father seems to send her along with deliveries of food and trade goods to Jamestown as a sign of goodwill and trust. At one point, Smith writes that a messenger from Powhatan told him, and I quote, "'How well Powhatan loved and respected me, and in that I should not doubt any way of his kindness, he had sent his child, which he most esteemed, to see me, and a deer and bread besides for a present.'" There are also descriptions in Jamestown records of her playing with the children. There were families at Jamestown and young apprentices, cartwheeling and generally carrying on in a very unladylike manner. In addition to this, based on Smith's records, he spent some time with her when she was at the fort. In Smith's 1612 publication, A Map of Virginia, he has a single line that seems to indicate that he and Pocahontas exchanged language lessons, Smith teaching her English and Pocahontas teaching him her language. There's more mentions of Pocahontas in his later writings, but we'll talk about those later. You'll understand why when we get to that part of the story. So Pocahontas seems to have spent some time at Jamestown and some time in John Smith's company during 1608. But in 1609, relations between the Jamestown settlers and the natives go sour. The drought is still ongoing, and even Powhatan's people are feeling the impact. So they're now reluctant to give or trade as much food as Jamestown wants. The Jamestown settlers are still partially dependent on the aid of the native tribes, and they get hangry really fast and threaten to raid and burn Powhatan villages for food. Boy. That escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. It jumped up a notch. It did, didn't it? In some of his later writings, Smith recounts one more meeting with Pocahontas, which I'll mention here, but I'll explain later why I don't necessarily find this record credible. Smith writes that he led a trading party to Powhatan in January of 1609, but when negotiations with Powhatan turned sour, Pocahontas snuck through the woods at night to Smith's camp to warn him that her father had ordered Smith killed, thereby saving the lives of Smith and the rest of his men at great risk to herself. The rest of 1609 at Jamestown is... Well, it's a shit show, to put it mildly. In April, an infestation of rats, along with the dampness, destroyed all their stored corn. And with many settlers refusing to pull their own weight, Smith gives his famous he that will not work shall not eat speech. Countrymen, the long experience of our late miseries, I hope, is sufficient to persuade everyone to present correction of himself, and think not that either my pains nor the adventurer's purses will ever maintain you in idleness and sloth. The greater part must be more industrious or starve. You must obey this now for a law that he that will not work shall not eat, except by sickness he be disabled. For the labors of thirty or forty honest and industrious men shall not be consumed to maintain a hundred and fifty idle loiterers. In August, the settlement also gets a surprise of 300 new settlers that they had not planned for, and the newcomers were also not prepared for life at Jamestown. Another food shortage soon follows, and then in October of 1609, Smith is injured in an accidental gunpowder explosion. Was it really an accident? Eh, who knows. John hadn't exactly endeared himself to the settlement while president of the colony. What we do know is that Smith is so injured that he's forced to return to England for treatment and never returns to Virginia again. Pocahontas and Powhatan are told that he has died. At this point, Pocahontas more or less disappears from the written record for about four years, between 1609 and 1613. Not much is known about her between these years, as she seemed to have had little to no contact with the Jamestown settlement. She may or may not have married and had a child during these years. Details on this are shaky. But despite her lack of contact with Jamestown, Jamestown hadn't forgotten her or how important she seemed to be to her father, and that's what brings her back into play in 1613. The First Anglo-Powhatan War is in full swing, and Pocahontas is lured onto the English ship of Captain Samuel Argyle and kidnapped. Argyle informs Chief Powhatan that he wouldn't return Pocahontas unless he released English prisoners, returned stolen weapons, and sent the colonists food. According to English records, Powhatan only sends about half the ransom, and Pocahontas remains in English captivity. Pocahontas was moved into the home of Reverend Alexander Whitaker in Henricus, where she was instructed in Christianity, English culture, and English language. Henricus was the second settlement in Virginia, which had been built by Sir Thomas Dale in 1611. It was located further inland on the James River than Jamestown. 
From the summer of 1613 through March of 1614, Pocahontas underwent the educational directions of Whitaker under the supervision of Sir Thomas Dale. She would have been dressed as an Englishwoman, treated with the various courtesies of an Englishwoman, and well guarded from both the potential rescue by Powhatan warriors, which never happened, and against violation of Englishmen who may have expected more from her than to see the betterment of her soul. She would have dressed, eaten, slept, and prayed like an English woman, and eventually Pocahontas was baptized and given the Christian name Rebecca. Of course, how much of this was genuine on her part and how much was simply Stockholm Syndrome or survival for her is something we can only speculate about as we don't have any records written from her perspective, not just from this period, but at all. If she ever did write her story, no one thought it was worth saving. Because of course they didn't. So what we do know about her is all from the English records of the men around her, which of course brings any commentary on her happiness, willingness, or agency in her life in the English settlements into severe question. The next major mention we have about her is in early 1614. After almost a year of captivity, Sir Thomas Dale brings 150 men and Pocahontas into Powhatan's territory in an effort to obtain the ransom. The natives were less than pleased to see them. The Englishmen respond to being attacked by burning houses and killing several men. Pocahontas is finally sent ashore to meet two of her brothers, where, according to the record, she says that she has been treated well by the English and that she is upset that her father valued her less than some old swords or axes. Which, I mean, she had a point? After this incident, she's brought back to the English settlement where she marries John Rolfe on April 5th, 1614. Sometime during her imprisonment, Pocahontas had become acquainted with a tobacco farmer named John Rolfe. The exact date of their meeting is uncertain. Rolfe was a prominent settler, having introduced Caribbean tobacco into the colony. Rolfe owned a plantation called Bermuda Hundred. In a letter written to Governor Thomas Dale in 1614, Rolfe asked for permission to marry Rebecca, and reading the letter, I have to say that it feels like Rolfe did in some way have true affection for her. What she felt for him is unknown, because, again, there's no surviving written record from her. In this letter, Rolf writes of struggling with his overwhelming feelings for her, despite knowing the heavy displeasure which Almighty God conceived against the sons of Levi and Israel for marrying strange wives. He writes of trying to forget her, distance himself from her, but being unable to do so. However, he also describes her in some terms that were a man to describe me using them would earn him a punch to the face. Examples being that her manners are barbarous, she's had poor education, she's not as pleasing to the eye as other Christian women he could definitely marry instead. Rolf seems to go out of his way to couch his request to Governor Dale as if Rolf is simply doing his Christian duty to marry her and aid in her conversion and life as a Christian woman. There's a lot going on in this letter. If you want to parse it yourself, be my guest, but it's 10 paragraphs of early 17th century spelling, so good luck with that. Suffice to say, whatever his feelings for Rebecca slash Pocahontas, Rolf was willing to put in a lot of effort to get permission to marry her. 1,895 words of handwritten pleading shows that. In any case, the marriage happened. Reverend Alexander Whitaker recorded this in a letter back to London on June 18, 1614. Sir, the colony here is much better. Sir Thomas Dale, our religious and valiant governor, hath now brought that to pass which never before could be effected. For by war upon our enemies and kind usage of our friends, he hath brought them to seek for peace of us, which is made, and they dare not break. But that which is best, one Pocahontas, or Matoa, the daughter of Powhatan, is married to an honest and discreet English gentleman, Master Rolf, and that after she had openly renounced her country idolatry, confessed the faith of Jesus Christ, and was baptized, which thing Sir Thomas Dale had labored a long time to ground in her." In 1615, Pocahontas gave birth to a son named Thomas in honor of the governor. The Virginia Company recognized Pocahontas' contributions to the colony that same year, and they awarded her with an annual stipend. One of her major contributions may have been in teaching Rolf how to cure tobacco in the style of her tribe, a job which would have traditionally been for the women of her tribe, which helped make the crops much more profitable. In the spring of 1616, Sir Thomas Dale sailed back to London to get more financial support for the Virginia Company. To boost publicity, he brought with him about a dozen Algonquian Indians, along with Pocahontas, her husband John Rolfe, and their infant son Thomas. Pocahontas captivated the English, and the publicity in turn sparked interest in the colonial settlement. She was introduced to the king and queen, as well as the Bishop of London. She was also briefly reunited with Captain Smith, who she had previously thought was dead, if you recall. This apparently did not go well for Smith, as Pocahontas had a sharp tongue and opinions about Smith now that she knew he wasn't dead. 
Smith wrote that she was so overcome with emotion that she could not speak and turned away from him. However, upon regaining her composure, Pocahontas reprimanded Smith for the manner in which he had treated her father and her people. She reminded him how Powhatan had welcomed him as a son, how Smith had called him father. Pocahontas, a stranger in England, felt that she should be able to call Smith father. When Smith refused to allow her to do so, she became angrier and reminded him that he had not been afraid to threaten every one of her people except her. She said the settlers had reported Smith had died after his accident but that she was really not surprised to find out he wasn't because your countrymen will lie much. So, not a heartwarming reunion, exactly. Though keep in mind that this version of events was written by Smith himself, and he's not exactly a reliable narrator, let's just say that. The royal family toured England for about seven months, but in 1617, they were ready to return to the colonies. In March, they boarded a ship, but before they even reached the open ocean, Pocahontas had become seriously ill and had to be taken ashore. In the town of Gravesend, Pocahontas died of an unspecified illness. Many historians believe that she suffered from some sort of upper respiratory ailment, such as pneumonia, while others think that she may have died from some form of dysentery or tuberculosis. According to Rolfe, Pocahontas said on her deathbed, "'All must die, but tis enough that my child live.'" At the age of about 21, she was buried at St. George's Church on March 21st, 1617. John Rolfe returned to Virginia, but left his young son with relatives in England. Father and son would never see each other again. John Rolfe died in 1622, and his son would not return to Virginia until 1635. Chief Powhatan was devastated upon learning of his daughter's death. He died about a year later, and relations between the Powhatan and Virginia colonists declined rapidly from that point forward. So if that's the true story, a tragedy of a young woman separated from her family and dying in a strange country, rather than the romantic tale of a woman risking her life to save a square-jawed man who sounds a lot like Mel Gibson, then why is that the story most of us grew up knowing? Well, the answer to that question is a white man's ego, because of course it is, and I suppose also the gullibility of the English looking for an entertaining story. And in this case, the white man in question is John Smith himself. After Pocahontas became a celebrity in England and verbally sucker-punched John Smith in 1616, Smith began writing his memoirs. He published The General History of Virginia in 1624 and The True Adventures and Observations of Captain John Smith in 1630. Notably, both of these are published well after the death of Pocahontas, John Rolfe, Governor Thomas Dale, Reverend Alexander Whitaker, you know, all the people who might have actually been able to question his narrative. So he writes a memoir with all the narrative truth of a man in a bar telling his friends about how he once caught a fish and it was this big, I swear. Or more accurately, a high school boy telling all his friends about how he totally banged his older sister's hot college roommate last summer. You know, like a liar. These two publications include a number of significant additions and changes. Most specifically, the 1624 edition is the first time in any of his published works that the story of Pocahontas saving Smith's life appears in print. This is also when that story about Pocahontas sneaking into the forest to warn Smith that his life is in danger appears as well. Which is why I said earlier that I have some reservations about that story. His version of the story is as follows. Oh, and as a side note, Smith writes about himself in third person in his own memoir. He's a walking red flag. Having feasted him after their best barbarous manner they could, a long consultation was held, but the conclusion was, two great stones were brought before Powhatan, then as many as could be laid hands on him, dragged him to them, and thereon laid his head, and being ready with their clubs to beat out his brains, Pocahontas, the king's dearest daughter, when no entreaty could prevail, got his head in her arms and laid her own upon his to save him from death." After this major change, he mentions Pocahontas in the story far more often than she was ever mentioned in his previous works. He also increases her age from the 10-year-old that he mentioned in the letter in 1608, now describing her as 13 years old. He also inserts her into another previous story that had not contained any mention of her, a story in which he is entertained by a bevy of naked young women that dance around a bonfire and have an orgy. Then they invite him back to their home and torment him with crowding, pressing, and hanging about him. Yeah, sounds like real torture to me, buddy. What is this, penthouse letters? 
The point is that John Smith waited until his story couldn't be contradicted by any living person, and then he self-aggrandized his own history shamelessly. And not just in regards to Pocahontas. Smith described being saved from execution by beautiful women more than once in his memoir. Not only that, but it's likely that he greatly exaggerated many of his early accomplishments as well. There are just a few too many wild stories about his life between 1596 and 1607, when he would have been between 16 and 27 years old. This includes fighting in wars ranging from the English war with Spain, the Dutch revolt against Spain, and fighting in the Holy Roman Empire's army against the Turks, where he supposedly killed and beheaded three Ottoman challengers in single combat duels, for which he was apparently knighted by the Prince of Transylvania and given a horse and a coat of arms that depicted three Turks' heads. Then he's wounded in battle, sold as a slave to a Turkish man who gives him as a gift to his mistress in Constantinople. She promptly falls in love with him, helps him escape death, then helps him escape through Russia and all the way back to England. I've seen seasons of Doctor Who that involved less travel and excitement. When it comes down to it, as historically inaccurate as the 1995 Disney Pocahontas film is, I can almost forgive it. If we look at the script compared to Smith's account in 1624, the differences become less stark. So if we look at that film as being based on Smith's writing, not history, well, it's not that far off the mark. And at the very least, the soundtrack was fantastic. If you haven't listened to the Radcliffe side of the song Savages lately, you should. It's an absolutely brutal takedown of white supremacy. So I will reluctantly give the 1995 movie a pass. Somewhat, anyway. But there is no excuse for Pocahontas 2. I despise that film on a soul-deep level that the first Pocahontas could never make me feel. Obviously, being kidnapped, married off, and dead by 21 makes for a poor children's film which is why they just shouldn't have made it in the first place. But the weird, complete rewrite of the story makes a lot more sense when you know that one of the writers, Alan Estrin, co-founded PragerU and serves as the executive producer for The Dennis Prager Show. There is nothing PragerU likes more than a good, whitewashed piece of American history that leaves out all the negative parts of colonialism. Well, that was a longer episode than usual. Thank you for showing up to listen to me bitch about history, and I hope you made it through the whole episode. Here's a little update. You can now find all the episodes and links to all the different ways to download and listen to the show on one convenient web page. If you go to www.podpage.com slash bitchy dash history, you can find it there. I'm also now uploading the podcast to YouTube as well. Wish me luck with that hellscape. I am already regretting that decision and I haven't even gotten a single comment yet. But if that's how you prefer to consume your podcasts for whatever reason, please subscribe. On Thursday, we'll be back with another episode of How Did America Get Here, in which we are going to talk about things like no-fault divorce and women's autonomy in America. If you are enjoying this podcast, please share it with your family and friends, and join the podcast Discord, where you can ask questions and request topics for future episodes. You can also follow me on TikTok and contribute to my chip jar slash coffee fund, both found at the link tree in my podcast description. You can also become a supporter of the podcast through Spotify and pay a small monthly subscription to help pay off the wisdom tooth extraction I just had to do without insurance. You know, if you want. <laughs>